sir. Your Bible is still open there to Numbers chapter 13. Missing God's opportunities. I want to help us today. I want to help me today. Uh, as we go through this, this is not to make us feel bad. This is not to put us down. What this is there, to challenge us not to miss God's opportunities. To challenge us, we may have missed some in the past, but with God's grace and God's help, we're not going to miss the opportunities that God gives us today and in the future. So we're looking at this passage, looking at missing God's opportunities. I think it's there in your notes. I don't know who originally said it, but it says, one of the poets said, For all sad words of tongue and pen, the saddest are these it might have been. I believe, well, let's put it this way. In Revelation, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, at the end of Revelation, at the end of that time, it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There's lots of reason for tears in our eyes until that point. But one of the things I think that most of us will be weeping for, most of us will be most sorry for, is the opportunities God gave us that we did not take hold of. The opportunities God presented us, but we did not go after. The opportunities we had, but we just let them pass by. Missed opportunities. We think of people in the Bible who missed opportunities. We think of Demas. He was there with the Apostle Paul, and he was a missionary with Paul. But Paul said, no, he's abandoned me. He's left me because he loved this present world. We think of Lot there in Sodom and Gomorrah, growing up with Abraham and all the loving of God and all the worship of God and the instruction of God. Yet he got away from that and got in Sodom. And in Sodom, instead of being a light, instead of being a salt, instead of witnessing to people, he became just like them. And we know the destruction that came. So he missed opportunities. So this morning, I want us to, I want to let the Holy Spirit speak to you about what opportunities you're letting go by. What opportunities you might be missing. Now, you can't always go back and fix previous opportunities missed, but you can say, Lord, starting today, you show me the opportunity, you give me the opportunities, I will not, with your help and your grace, I will not miss these opportunities. We're looking at here probably one of the greatest loss of opportunity anywhere in the Bible. The children of Israel there at Canish Barnea, about to go into Canaan, about to go into the promised land. This promised land had been promised them for generations and generations, and now they're just on the edge. You know, we know Canaan, the promised land, is not heaven. It's not a picture of heaven, unless you just consider that's your last step of life, then I guess it could be a lot of songs we think about it. But Canaan there, the promised land, is a picture of the fruitful, growing Christian life. It's just being and you being used of God in a marvelous way. It's the place God wants us. It's the place where we can grow. Looking at the whole story, coming out of Egypt is a picture of salvation. The blood on the doorposts and the land and on of the houses, a picture of salvation. And coming out of Egypt, being saved. Crossing the Red Sea is a picture of separation, separating from the world, separating from sin. And then now going into the promised land is, the, is a picture of possessing, possession to Christian life. And so here they are. They've come to this place. They've come out of Egypt. God did miracles to get them out of Egypt. They went and they got the Ten Commandments and the other commandments. God used them, did miracles in providing water and food for them. Now they're getting ready to go into the promised land, getting ready to take those steps of all those things that they'd been promised, but they missed it. They missed it. They would not go in. Because of their fear, because of the rebellion, because of what we'll see this morning, they would not go in. They said, we're not going to go into the land. We're not going to go a step farther. In fact, we're going to go back the other way. We will not do it. And God then at that point says, all right, you don't want to go in? I'll give your children the promised land. And he said, for everybody from age 20 and up must die before the children, your children, get to go into the promised land. So a whole ge several generations had to be wiped out, had to die for them to be able to place where they can go in. So looking at that this morning, again, let the Holy Spirit speak to you about what opportunities God is giving you, what opportunities you have in this church, in your family, in this life, in this city, and do not miss the opportunity. But they missed this great opportunity. Here it was. They were going to go in. But because they did not, God says, then I'm not going to let you go in. Your children will. So this morning, let's look very quickly, just some simple thoughts about missing God's opportunity. And you have to let the Holy Spirit speak to you about the opportunity, also about how that you're falling into the same trap the children of Israel did. Again, this isn't to make us feel bad. This is to challenge us to say, with God's help, I do not want to miss a single opportunity God gives me. Looking very quickly, here we go. Are you with me this morning? Amen. All right, please stay with me. Number one, we find the prelude to missed opportunities. The prelude to missed opportunities. 
You know, they'd been on the march a good while. They had gone through many trials. They had had some many victories. They saw some many miracles. But now they're on the edge. But we see some initial steps that was a prelude to the fact that they were going to miss opportunities. So we have to look to see, do I see these preludes in my life? Do I see these uh, missing things in my life? Number one, we find the first prelude to missed opportunities is a delay in obeying the will of God. A delay in obeying the will of God. God, they were supposed to just go in. I believe that they were coming here, that God was moving, they were supposed to go in, but they stopped and they delayed. Now, let's look at it. Uh, Numbers 13, verses 1 through 3, very quickly again. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send the men up, send thou men, that they may search out the land of Canaan. I'm going to help you with an issue many people have. Which I give unto the children of Israel, and every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran, all those men whose heads of the children of Israel. So God, here Moses is saying, by the commandment of God, he's sending men. Look over at Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. This is Deuteronomy, if you're not familiar with it, this is Deuteronomy is Moses' last sermon. Moses, before he dies, preaches this to the children of Israel, recapping what happened. Recapping what happened from the wilderness and into the promised land. So he's talking about that same event here in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 21. But I want you to notice there seems to be a conflict. There seems to be a discussion. There seems to be what many people would say, a contradiction in the Bible. Let me help you something. There are no contradictions in the Bible. There are no, we just have to know where we believe. But notice in in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 21, he says, Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land. So this is Moses telling the children of Israel, reminding them what happened back in Numbers chapter 13. Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it as the Lord God of thy fathers has said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. So he said when we got to the edge of the land, he said it was time for us to go up. There was no reason to delay. There was no time to delay. It was time to go. He took us across the wilderness. He brought us to the edge. And now it's time to go up and possess the land. But something happened, verse 22. And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search out the land. And bring us word again, by what way we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me, Moses said, well, and I took twelve men of you, one of the tribe. So that looks like a contradiction. Here he says, you came to me and said, we want to send spies into the land. And it pleased me. So Moses said, it sounds like a great idea to me. Thanks for bringing it to me. And so we did that. But in in Numbers 13, it says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, send the men that they may search out the land. So we've got what in Deuteronomy, or Numbers, says the Lord said, send them in. And we find in Deuteronomy, Moses said, you came to me and we decided we wanted to send in. You say, which, is that a contradiction? No. Which one is so? Both. Both. We have two different sides of the story. What we have is Moses saying there in Deuteronomy, we're coming up the edge. It's time to go in. Let's go possess the land. God has led us to this place. Let's go in. He says, but he said, remember, he said, you brought people to me and said, well, let's, let's, let's hold off for a second. Let's, let's, let's put this on hold a minute. Let's send in spies to figure it out. Let's send in spies to check it out. And Moses said, that sounds like a good idea. You know, God will often let you do what He does not want you to do. Did you know that God will often give in to our demands and desires, usually to our own harm? Moses said it's time to, or God said it's time to go in. Moses knew that. He said it's time to go in to take the land. But the children of Israel said, no, let's wait. And so God said, all right, you want to go in? Apparently in Numbers 13, He says, go ahead and do it. And so He did it. Boy, let's, let's, let's not tell God what, what needs to be done. Amen? Amen. Let's, te- let's not tell God how it ought to be. And so it looks like that they went to Moses. Moses had a good idea. And God says, fine, go ahead and send in the spies. So he did tell them to go in only after they said, we're going to send in spies and do that. But God will often give in to our request. And our demands, even when it's not good for us. Psalm 106, verse 13, talking about the children of Israel when they had the manna. 
And when they wanted the quail, it says, They soon forgot his works, and they waited not for his counsel. In other words, they didn't wait for God's counsel. They said, this, We've got our own idea. We've got our own plan. They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness, lusting for food, lusting for meat, and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness to their souls. Oh, be careful what you ask God for. You ought to say, God, I want what you want. I want to be praying in your will. And God, if I'm praying out of your will, Lord, you change my prayer. You change my heart. You change my desire because I only want what you want. So he gave their request there. And we see in Psalms, he says, but he sent leanness to their souls. Here, apparently, they came to Moses. Well, wait, well, let's wait. We're, we, I know, Moses, you just said we had time to go up. But let's go ahead and pause and think about this. And God apparently said, fine, go ahead and send in your spies. But well, we're so often apt to tell God what we want, make our own demands known. Sometimes we'll tell God where we want to live. Yeah. I don't know why anybody would ever want to leave California. You laugh. But we tell God, this is where I'm going to live. This is where I want to live. We don't ask God, where should I live? We don't ask God, what's your will for my life? We say, I'm a little bit tired of California. I'm a little bit tired of this place. And the taxes are getting a little bit high. And it's getting a little too cold or a little too hot or a little too left wing or whatever it is. And we say, I'm just, I'm just going to go ahead and move. You say, well, if God doesn't want me to, he'll stop me. He may, but he may not. Most likely he will not because he lets you go just like them. He said, it's time to go up. And they said, well, let's wait a second. Let's send in spies. It may be who you're going to marry or if you're going to marry where you're going to go to school, how, what vocation you're going to have. Be careful, let God direct you. So we find they began this delay by just having their own way. So no, no contradictions in the Bible. You just have to let the Bible interpret itself. Amen. Amen. Oh, okay. So God said, yeah, but so God said, all right, because that was not his plan. He said, it's time to go up. And they didn't pray about it. They didn't think about it. They said, oh, wait a minute. Let's send the spies. So we've got a delay. We've got a delay. We know what we say around here. To delay is to dis obey. Look at verse back in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 21. They delayed going in. They delayed obeying the will of God. God's will was for them to go in, but they stopped. They delayed. Verse number 20 again of Deuteronomy 1, and I said unto you, ye are come to the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord your God hath doth give unto us. Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord the God of thy fathers has said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. And then they came near and said, Let us send in the spies. Well, let's just learn this. What God, when God tells us it's time, it's time. Don't, super, don't, don't impose upon God. Don't presume upon God. Just be careful. So their prelude to missed opportunities, how they did not go into the promised land, the first step was they delayed obeying the will of God. They delayed doing what God wanted. So they just paused. Ladies and gentlemen, let me caution you. When God says it's time, now I'm not asking you to go before God, but when God says it's time, do not delay. Because that first step that you take of delaying is going to put you on a path to missing the great opportunities. So not only did they delay the, op the obeying of the will of God, number two, they started doubting the Word of God. They started doubting the Word of God. Numbers chapter 13, flip back there. And in verse number 18. Well, back to verse 17, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain. Now here we're going to see even Moses had some doubts. Even Moses began to doubt the word of God. It says, And see the land and what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak or few or many, and the land which is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad. And what the cities be that they dwell in, whether they're in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not. And be of good courage and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe fruits. So now they're getting ready to go in the land and they say, well, let's pause. We've got to spy this land out. We want to know what kind of land is it. Is it a good land or bad land? Is it a land that's going to help us or is it going to be a bad land for us that's going to hurt us? If they had just been believing the Word of God, they would have known what kind of land it was. 
God, over and over and over and over for generations. I mean, ten generations of the children of Israel have been told, I'm going to take you to a land that flows with milk and honey. <laughs> he said, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to flow with milk and honey. It's going to have all the needs you want. It's going to be a blessed place. It's going to be a great land. And for generation after generation, for ten generations, they've heard that. And we've got it there, I think, in your notes. Some of it, Exodus 3.8. He said, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. This is what God says. I'm coming down to bring you out of the slavery and bring you up into the land of a good land and a large. See, that's a good land and a good place unto a land flowing with milk and honey. He said, it's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 3, 17. And I said, he reminds him again, I will bring you up out of the affliction of, the, of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, and Amorites, and the Perzites, and the Hivites, and Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 15, 5. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites and Hittites and Amorites and Hivites and Jebusites, which ye swear to your fathers to give thee, a land flowing with milk and honey. They've been promised over and over, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. That, they were there to go into the land of milk and honey. That was God's promise. But now they're on the edge. Now they're having opportunity to say, well, wait a minute, we better check it out to see what kind of land it is. They begin to doubt God's word. They begin to doubt God's promises. In other words, they were, I'm, I'm from Missouri. And the old expression in Missouri, show me. I said, all right, we've heard it, we've read about it, it's been told about us, but you, we need to see it. They were there by the promises of God fulfilled and all the provision God did getting me out of there, and yet they began to doubt the word. One of the great things we can do, and you can, I can do, that we do not miss God's opportunities in our lives is to settle the Word of God in our hearts. Say, this is the Bible. I'm going to believe every bit. Because you can believe every bit. It's never been proven wrong. It's always right. It's settled forever in heaven. But when we begin to doubt the Word of God. So here God opens up an opportunity for you. He said, here's an opportunity for you to serve. Here's an opportunity for you to go. He said, well, I've heard it's good. I've heard it's great. But I better check this out a little bit. I'm going to delay just a little bit. I know God wants me to step up and get involved in this. I know God's opened the door for this to reach out to this family. I know God is. But you know, I'm going to just stop and back up and just check it out a little bit. I'm going to investigate this and I want to know if it's really good to do this sort of thing or not and so we had the delay and then disobedience to and doubting the word of God let's just get it settled that it is the word of God one of the great things and great days in your Christian life when you say I'm just going to believe this is God's word because it is and whatever he commands me to do I'm going to do it I'm not going to argue I'm not going to resist I'm not going to turn away I'm just going to obey and believe the word of God so when the word of God tells me something that's different from what the world is telling me I'm going to stick with the word of God when I read something in the Word of God and it tells me one thing and it goes against my grain, I'm going to go ahead and, what was that old Billy Sunday said? Somebody says, well, you're preaching, rubs the cat the wrong way. He said, well, then turn the cat around. And that's what you ought to be. He said, I'm just going to turn, the, just turn around. If you find the Word of God rubbing you the wrong way, then you just turn around and let it rub you the right way. Boy, just believe that and accept that. And so he said, over and over, God says, the land flowing with milk and honey. They probably sat around at night during the campfires talking about the land flowing with milk and honey, how good the milk was going to be, how much honey they were going to have, and who likes working with bees and all those things. But now they got the opportunity. They said, well, we better check this out. We're not so sure we're get what we're getting into. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive the word of God, he said, what, this is in the New Testament, when you have received the word of God, which you have heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So you receive this not as the word work of men, but the word of God that's working in us. So we find the prelude to missed opportunities. If you find yourself delaying, I know what God wants me to do now, but I'm just going to wait a while. Watch out. You're headed for missing opportunity. When you begin to doubt the Word of God, doubt that it's so good, doubt that it's so wonderful, this opportunity is going to be so marvelous tonight. When you begin to doubt the Word of God, then you're headed making steps to missing the opportunity. Number three, not only is it delaying to do His will, doubting His Word, but also deliberating on the ways of God, deliberating on the ways of God. Deuteronomy 1 22, we just read it, and it says, When ye come, and he said, and ye come near unto me, every one of you, and said, This is what they came. They said, Before we go in, we're going to send out spies, and we will send men before us, and they shall search out the land and bring us word again. 
by what way we must go up. And in what cities shall we go? In other words, we got to spy out the land so we know where to go. So we know what city to go to first. So we know the path where to go. So we got to send in spies. <laughs> what had been leading them for the last several years? That pillar of fire, that pillar of cloud, Every day. It was over the tabernacle, and when they, they sat there, and when it moved, they moved when it was time to go. So it would led them. It led them every day. What direction they're supposed to go, what step. It was still apparently leading them those days. But now they're saying, we're going to ignore that pillar of fire. We're going to ignore that cloud. We want to figure out our own way to go in there. After all, this is, it's one thing when we're wandering around in a desert, desert. There's nothing going to harm us. But it's another thing to go into this land. We want to know our way. We want to have an input. We want to make the decision which way we ought to go. Well, when we get to the place when we decide we're going to do it our own way, we're in trouble. We, they need to say, God's been leading us so far. He's still there. He's going to lead us. I need to go ahead and not deliberate it. Oh, be careful when you say, I've got to have my way. This is the way I think. The Bible talks in many places. There's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the ends thereof are the way of death. And that's what they did. They said to go up their own way. God had been leading them all the way. So we find a prelude, a delay of obeying the Word of God. I know in my life I've missed opportunities sometimes because I delayed. I delayed. God wanted me to do this. And I says, no, I'm not ready. I'm not sure. And I delayed. And the Holy Spirit kept pressuring. I says, no. Oh, and the opportunity closed. We doubt the Word of God. I don't think it's going to be right. I don't think it's so. I, I, I need to figure this out more. I just say, oh, no, we're going to miss the opportunity. And then when we demand our own way and we deliberate, deliberate about the ways of God, well, is this the best way? I know God says this, but I think this might work better. I know God wants me to live this way or act this way or dress this way, but I think this way may be better. Oh, you're on your way to missing the opportunities of God. So we find the prelude very quickly. Number two, we find the pattern of missed opportunities. The pattern, that was just laying the groundwork. Because they delayed, because they began to doubt the Word of God, because they began to disagree and argue and, 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 and about the ways of God, the way God wanted them to do, the direction He wanted to go, they wanted to set their own. But now we find the pattern of missed opportunities. What happens when we get that way? What happens when we get ready to miss opportunities? Number one, and I know if you're like me, you've known this, the discouragement of the people of God. The discouragement of the people of God. One of the great things that caused them to miss the opportunities is they got discouraged. Discouraged. Deuteronomy 1, 28. Again, Moses talking about this event in Numbers 13. And they said, Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our heart. If you remember the spies that came in, they sent in 12 spies. They sent in 12 spies. They came back and for 40, in the wilderness or in the land of Canaan 40 days. That's why they had to wander and wait for, 40 years in the wilderness later for everybody that died because of one day for every, one year for every day. But they sent the 12 spies in and the spies came back. Ten of them, two of them said, yes, we can do it. It's a great land. Let's go do it. Ten of them says, no way. Let's not do it. And we find it says, our brethren have discouraged our heart, saying the people are greater and taller than we and the cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of Anax there and on it went. They were discouraged. They were discouraged. The word discouraged there means to liquefy. Man, just melt the heart. Melt the heart. Boy, be careful when you begin to be discouraged. Be careful when your heart begins to melt. Be discouraged when you begin to feel, be careful when you begin to feel overwhelmed and begin to feel like you just don't have any hope. Be careful because you're liable to miss the opportunity. I know sometimes it's going to be fearful. I know there's sometimes going to be questions. But boy, be careful about being discouraged. We find the discouragement of the people of God. We're so easily discouraged. Do you understand? We are. How many here have ever been discouraged? And when you look back at it, you say, why, why should I be discouraged? The psalmist so often, so often said, oh, so why art thou cast down? We believe in God. We have God on our side. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We've got the Word of God that tells us how to live. We've got the Holy Spirit of God that helps us live, that empowers us and corrects us and directs us. We've got a home in heaven. The very worst we can ever have it is here in this world because we're headed to the wonderful place. And we've got God who loves us and cares for us. Why in the world would we be discouraged? But they were discouraged because they heard the people say, oh, it's going to be too hard. It's going to be too difficult difficult. It's going to be so much, oh, well, we get so discouraged. Satan discourages us. He tells us lies. 
that God does not care. He tells us lies that God can't take care of us. He tells us lies that God's really not leading us. He tells us lies and he discourages. The world pressures us and discourages us. You say, I want to serve God. I do not want to miss an opportunity. I want to go into the promised land. But Satan says I'm not worthy. Satan says it's not going to be that good. Satan says it's going to be too hard. And the world says you don't want to cause trouble. You don't want to cause a ruckus. You don't want to have people look down on you. Oh, and we begin to get discouraged in our lives. And that discouragement then prevents us from going on. The flesh says that the demand is too hard. It's going to be too hard, too difficult. You're going to have to give up some money. You're going to have to give up some sleep. And we do those things and we get discouraged. In Deuteronomy 128 it says, And our brethren have discouraged our heart. So Satan may have used the brethren, but it was the brethren. It was their own people that discouraged them. Don't be a discourager to God's people. Don't be a discourager. Don't you be the one that causes somebody else to miss their opportunity. So preacher, how could I cause somebody else to miss the opportunity? Parents, you have all kinds of influence over your children. Don't cause your children to miss God's opportunity for their lives because you discourage them in the things of God. So, well, you don't want to be a preacher. You don't want to be a missionary because of this. You don't want to do it. No, don't do that. Don't be discouraging to your children. Encourage them. Build them up. Point them in the things of God. Point them to the obedience of God. Don't be a discourager to your, your children. Don't be a discouragement to your spouse. Ladies, when your husband tries to make a spiritual decision, don't condemn him for it. Build him up. Encourage them. Don't discourage them. Have them miss opportunities. As God begins to work in his heart, maybe God's got a plan for him and a place for him. Don't be the one to discourage him and say, well, you couldn't do that. You could never do that. I can't believe you're even thinking about that. How could you think about that? What's going to do our family? And you discourage them, have them miss the opportunity. Men, don't discourage your wives. Lest they miss an opportunity of God. Well, we're not going to go do that. You spend too much time down at the church. We're not going to. Oh, don't do that. We find that they missed the greatest opportunity. A generation, a nation going into the promised land that had been promised. But they missed it because they got discouraged. Don't be a discourager. You can discourage the church. No amens, no showing up, no expressing of joy, just murmuring and complaining. <laughs> What they used to say in the South? Having roast preacher for lunch. You know, you get, over, get to over supper, over lunch, and boy, you just, all you talk about is how bad the preacher was, how he preached too long. Yeah, he does. Do you notice that about your pastor? He just preaches way too long. Heard too many amens kind of under the breath there. That's all right. But don't discourage. Don't discourage. So we find the pattern was discouragement. You know, here's what's interesting. We find in this story the confirmation of the blessing. The confirmation of the blessing. Look at Numbers 13. Flip back over there. Numbers 13, verse 27. And here's how discouragement happens. Verse 7, we have the confirmation of the bounty and the blessing. So they brought back that one cluster of grapes that they had carried on a pole between them it was so large and so huge. And they said, here's what the spy said. And they told him and said, we came into the land whither thou sent us. And surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. They said, it really does. It really does. God has promised us for generations. He's going to take us to a land that flowing with milk and honey. And we got it there. And sure enough, that's what he's saying. Sure. Back in the south, they say, sure enough. They said, surely. Surely it does run with milk and honey. Boy, the confirmation there, it is so. Uh, by the way, I'm glad he, I'm here to tell you that God's Word is so. God's promises are so. Taking God at His Word is a blessing. It is a joy. The living the Christian life is a land of milk and honey. Sometimes the bees sting. Sometimes the cow stick, kicks. But there is the land of milk and honey. Boy, you can just take my word for it. But see, they heard that. They had the confirmation of the bounty. Boy, isn't it good when God confirms His Word? And he confirmed it. They said, it is. But I want you to notice the sad thing, verse 28. Nevertheless. No, it is flowing with milk and honey. Nevertheless, the people be strong and dwell in the land and the cities. And it talks about and the children of Anak and the Amalekites are there and the Hittites and the Jebusites. Yes, they had the confirmation of the blessing, but they also had the confirmation 
of the battles. The battle's coming. Let me help you with something. Everywhere God said it's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey, He says, you know who's there? The Amalekites, the Hittites. He gave them the list. Everybody was there. And now they went and saw out the land, and they were surprised at the Amalekites and the Hittites. And No, God told them all the way. It's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey, and you're not going to be able to just walk in. If they're not going to run from you. He said there's going to be some battles and there's going to be some struggles. And so sometimes in our life we get discouraged because we hear there's going to be some battles. We hear there's going to be some decisions. We see there's going to be some hardships as we go and take the opportunity God has. But I guarantee you the joy and the blessings far outweigh the battles that you're going into. And that's exactly what it is. They said, this is flowing with milk and honey. But the people are there also, like God said. He said it was going to be flowing with milk and honey, and it was, but also the enemy is going to be there, those that own the land. And so sometimes we get discouraged. We think, that's going to be too hard. That's going to cost me something. That's going to be a challenge. That's going to be a difficulty in my life. But you know what? We're willing to battle for what we want. Well, you'll battle for that new house. You'll sacrifice You'll give up french fries. Maybe. You want a nicer car. Boy, you'll, you'll give up some vacation time so you can get the extra work in. You want a promotion. You want prestige. You want to send your kids to a college. You sacrifice for all those things. But when God says, I want to bless you. I want to give you something wonderful. But you're going to need to have to work for it. We say, well, I don't want to work for it. Well, be careful. Discouragement is the pattern for missed opportunities. It starts with discouragement. Number two, not just discouragement of the people. We find the deliberate rebellion of the people. The deliberate rebellion of the people. It's one thing to be discouraged. It's another thing to say no. It's one thing to be a little fearful. It's another thing to say no. They simply said no. In Numbers 14, and all the congregation, so they heard this report about the giants in the land, and they were looked like grasshoppers in their own sight, and all the cities are walled, all these people. It says, and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God he had, we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? They just said, we're not going. In Deuteronomy 1, 26, it says, Notwithstanding, ye would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of God. Boy, just deliberate rebellion. But you see the process. We have the prelude that puts us in that position where we're ready to argue with God. Then we get discouraged and think it's going to be too hard. It's a little bit difficult. I'm not sure how this is going to go. And so finally we decide, no, I'm just going to rebel. The Bible says, for rebellion is the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as the iniquity and idolatry. Boy, but it's, that rebellion is a sin. When God opens an op opportunity, when God opens the door of opportunity, and He said, now let's go up and take it. Now it's open. Now's the time. This is for you. This is what I've got. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, or it's going to be a place of ministry that's going to be such a blessing. You'll grow. You'll be a help. You'll be an encouragement to others. Go through it, and you say, well, I don't know. I need to delay a little bit. I need to think about it a little bit more. I need to pray about it a little bit more. I need to figure it out. I need to do some more study on it. I need to Google what all that means. I need to do that. Well, we'll watch out. When you delay, and when you begin to argue about the way because you're finally going to get a little discouraged and you're going to say I think I'll just not go notice they wept they cried they cried all night they wept because they were under pressure and because of fear you want to know how to lose your Christian joy rebel against God you just say no to God and you'll lose that joy wouldn't it be better for them? They'd have a whole different spirit if they just said, boy, we're going up. We're going up. Giants are there. And it would be like Caleb says, well, God is on our side. We're able to do it. If we just said, well, I'm going to go. But no, they refuse. And when we rebel against God and argue with God, we lose that joy. Then it said they began to murmur. They began to murmur against Moses and Aaron. <laughs> you know what Moses wants us to do? Get blessed. You know what Moses wants us to do? Be rewarded. You know what Moses wants us to do? To get the, enjoy the land of flowing with milk and honey. You know what Moses wants us to do? Receive the blessings of God. How dare he tell us what we need to do? They begin to murmur and complain against Moses. Very quickly we notice the disgraceful retreat. We must hurry. 
the disgraceful retreat. So they said, no, we're not going to do it. And in verse number 4 of Numbers 14, And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return unto Egypt. <laughs> we're out of here. Not only are we going to not stay here, we're going back to Egypt, back where we were slaves, back where we were mistreated, back where we were beaten. He said, we are out of here. They just retreated. I hate to tell you this, but you're either going forward or you'll be going backwards. You'll, go, you'll be going forward or be going backwards. When you start telling God no, you're going to start going backwards. No, God. Not going to do it. I want to go back the way I was. I want to go back to the other place. Oh, we get, begin to get backslidden when we get that rebellious heart. Because when you say no to God in one area, you'll backslide in other areas. Are you listening to me? When you say no to God in one area, you begin to backslide in other areas also. Because you've already surrendered to disobedience. You've already surrendered to uh, rebellion. You've already surrendered to your own way. You've already given up God's way in one area. It'll spread to others. Very quickly, the pain of missed opportunities. We'll go quickly. The pain of missed opportunities. First of all, notice they were pardoned but not permitted. They were pardoned but not permitted. Look at verse number 20 of Numbers. So God was already on to him, and he says, okay, you're not going to go in. They, 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 they started to go back. If you know the story, they says, we're going to go back. Moses says, no, don't go back. Don't go back. You won't be there. And in verse number 20, so he's praying for the children of Israel. And the Lord said, and it said, I have pardoned according to thy word. Moses prayed for they would pardon. I have prayed them. I'm glad. By the way, I'm glad God pardons. Amen. In other words, he says, I forgive them. I forgive them for the rebellion. I forgive them for that. I, I pardon them. But he says, but. But, as truly as I live, God said, all the earth shall be filled with the glory. And then he goes on and talks about him. He says, they shall not go in. They were pardoned, but not permitted. Sometimes we think, well, I'll, I'll just refuse God, and if it gets bad enough, then I'll get forgiveness, and he'll forgive me. Yes, he will forgive. But that does not mean he's going to pardon, he's going to permit you to have the opportunity. God is a God of the second chance. Most times. Do not presume upon God. You think of Uzzah and the ark. Remember the ark was there. They were carrying the ark on the, on the, on the cart instead of carrying it on the poles. And the ark, and the, and the, ark, the oxen stumbled and the cart about fell off. And Uzzah put up his hand to stop it from falling. God killed him right there because he touched the ark. Don't, only the priest was supposed to touch the ark. He didn't get a second chance. God didn't make him sick. God didn't just make him lose his job. He killed him on the spot. No second chance. No second chance. Don't always have a second chance. They were pardoned, but not permitted. Oh, the pain. As that generation for the next 40 years waiting, died man after man, lady after lady, waiting for those 40 years to be done, wandering with us, waiting for them to die so their kids and grandkids could go pick up something. Boy, what a painful existence that must have been, reminding them of what they did. Verse number 40, they tried to go it alone. See, when you get so rebellious, let's look at verse number 40. I'm sorry, look at verse number 40. Verse 39, and Moses told these sayings unto the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. They cried because they were supposed to go in and didn't, and now they think they ought to go in, and God says you can't go, and now they're crying again. Well, rebellion is not a happy place to be. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up unto the top of the mountain and said, Lo, we be here, and we'll go up to the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. In other words, they says, never mind, we'll go in. I know, I know God says we can't go in anymore. I know He says we're going to die and we can't go in. But we're here and we're going to go in anyway. And Moses said, Moreover, now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord your God is not among you that ye be not smitten them before your enemies. And you read, and they got beat up. They lost the battle. They said, we're going to go in anyway. Well, that rebellious spirit of saying, no, I'm not going in. And then when God says, no, don't go in, they said, we're going in anyway. The pain of missed opportunities. Very quickly, chapter 14 of Numbers, verse number 8, and we'll find the prevention for missed opportunities. The prevention for missed opportunities. Just a very simple verse or two, very simple thought, and we'll be done. How to prevent missing opportunities like the children of Israel did. 
Numbers 14, verse number 8. Here we have Caleb speaking to them. They've said we weren't going to go in, didn't want to go in. He's trying to encourage them. He said, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth in milk and honey, with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear the people of the land, for they are bred to us, their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us, fear them not. So when they're getting ready to say, we can't go in and we're afraid to go in. He said, here's the answer. He said, this is how it's going to keep us from missing opportunities. Number one, doubt not. Doubt not. Do not doubt it. Do not. If the Lord delight in us, He will bring us to the land that he ge- and will give it a land which floweth with milk and honey. In other words, don't doubt what God said. Don't doubt His word. Don't doubt His commands. Don't doubt His instruction. Don't doubt His ways. Just don't doubt. We call that having faith. Just have faith. God said it and He brought us here to do this. Let's just trust God. Don't doubt. When you begin to doubt, you're headed for missing, missing the opportunity. So doubt not. Whatever God's opened the door for you, don't doubt it. That's what God wants you to do. Don't be foolish and obey. Doubt not. Number two, rebel not. Verse number eight, only rebel not against the Lord. Don't rebel. Don't rebel. Well, I doubt. All right, if you can't get past your doubts, just obey anyway. Are you listening to me? Boy, I tell you, there's going to be times in your life you say, oh, man, I just don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know if I can. But God says I must, so I will. How many here have ever been in the military? Okay, guys, I want you to get your machine guns and charge that nest. Oh, I don't know. I'm not real crazy about that idea. I need to think about it. No, no, you just do it anyway. So it is with our commander God, because God knows what's best. He wants what's best. Just don't rebel. So doubt not, rebel not, fear not. Fear not. Don't let fear stop you. Don't let fear hinder you. God does not give us the spirit of fear. Look at verse number 9 then. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. Don't fear the world. Don't fear those those people around us. Don't fear that. And then forget not. Don't forget that God is with us. Notice what it says. Their defense, end of verse number 9, is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear not. Don't forget, God's with you. God's with you. Oh, with the great things. He says, let's go. I'm going to take you in the land. I'm going to lead you to the land. Oh, I'm, God is with us. I do not have to fear it. As long as I don't forget, God has brought me here. As long as I don't forget, God's presence is there. As long as I don't forget, God's power is there. Wow. Lost opportunity. The greatest opportunity going into the promised land. And they missed it. Don't miss the opportunity. Don't miss the opportunity. Obey God in everything and don't miss the opportunity. But you know what the worst opportunity to miss is? The opportunity to be saved. That's the worst missed opportunity. To miss the opportunity to be saved. Say, so preacher, what does saved means? Means you're on your way to heaven means you've trusted Christ as Savior. See, the Bible says we're all sinners. Oh, we, we criticize the children of Israel, but they're just like us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all sin. And the Bible says because of that sin, we all deserve hell. For the wages of sin is death. My paycheck for my sin is death. Revelation tells us that death is a lake of fire. In other words, I deserve to go to hell. That's what I deserve. I still deserve it. And but for God and Christ... And him saving me, that's where I'd be headed still. But God committed his love toward us. While we were yet sinners, even though we were sinners and deserve hell, Christ died for us. He died and paid my sin debt and your sin debt on the cross of Calvary. And if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that means just admit he is God like he said he was, and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead. In other words, you say, yes, Jesus died for me. He was buried and he rose again. It was God dying for me and he died for me and he paid my sin debt. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In other words, I believe and I trust and I call and I put my trust only in Jesus Christ. When I do that, not in my church, not in my religion, not in my good works. No, no, no. It's all Jesus Christ. And when he saves me, oh, my name's written in the Lamb's book of life. My sins are put away from me. It's covered by his blood. Wow, I am born again. But see, the door gets open. Don't miss the opportunity. You may die before the next opportunity, so to speak, happens. Or even as he said in in 
Genesis, my spirit will not always strive with man. He said, there's going to come a day, he said, I'm not going to fight him anymore. I'll just let him have their way. Oh, that's why you've got to take the opportunity to be saved, to be on your way to heaven, to know Christ as personal Savior. Yeah. Romans tells us, he got back to the place of those folks, he didn't want to think about God, so he said, fine. He turned them over to reprobate mind. He quit bothering them. Don't miss it. Get saved today. Say, preacher, I am saved. Good. What are you missing? What opportunities are you missing? Well, if I'm going to do that, I'll have to come back on Sunday nights or Wednesday nights. Well, yeah, yeah. The Amorites are in the land. Yeah, it's going to cost something. Well, I don't think I'm worth Don't miss the opportunity. Well, I better think about it some more. I'll, I'll pray about it for about five years. No, not if God's saying now's the time. He may be saying now's not the time, but if we have to be honest, let God say is the time. So what opportunities are you missing? Don't miss God's opportunities. Israel. missed it. Let's bow our heads, please.